tonight we are at, at step four, in which we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. I think of all the steps, this is probably, you know, this is the most important information. It's the information that we're going to gather to proceed through the rest of the steps. And, and this is why it is so clear and simple. I mean, we, we really, you know, we, even alcoholics can't uh, confuse that, what it says. It says, make an inventory <laughs> of ourselves. You know, we alcoholics, we, can, uh, we can't make a lot out of that. It says, inventory ourselves with a couple of adjectives, searching and fairness. Real simple. To, to get to step four, we begin at the first step. And each week we do a slight review and the first step is the, is the beginning, and this is why it's so important. It's the foundation of recovery. What is the problem? We have to gather that information, and we say that the big book gives us the information, the doctor's opinion, to make a self-diagnosis. Probably this seems to be the most evasive thing for the alcoholic. Here's the first step. <clears throat> uh, you know, it is... Uh, I was talking today to some guys, and I was telling them, you know, we, most people who say have alcoholism today, uh, <clears throat> it is really two things involved. Number one, not only do they have alcoholism, the first thing we suffer from is ignorance. See, if you've got a disease and don't know you have it, you've you got two diseases. You're on top of being an alcoholic, you're pretty ignorant because you don't even know you got it. And so, but most alcoholics will never realize they're alcoholics. You know. you know, most of them are still blaming on their wife and on their job and on these things. You know, I ain't got it. In fact, as we said, you know, those are the, the ones that persist not having it are the ones that's got it. The one that swears and curses, I ain't got it, has got it. And we alcoholics are never realize. But the first step is when we realize that we do have the problem and understand what it is. Once we understand the problem, and in the big book it says we find that we have a disease. We have a disease that is twofold. We have a physical allergy of the body manifested by the craving of alcohol. And we have an obsession of the mind, a, a mental obsession which is manifested by taking the first drink. That's, this is what makes us take that first drink. You know, he said we become restless, nervous, and discontent, and we remember the sense and ease and comfort that came at once by taking a few drinks of alcohol. And we alcoholics, we go through a period of time, and, and this goes wrong, and that goes wrong, and this goes wrong, and this goes wrong, and pretty soon everybody's against you the way it looks. You know, the wife won't do what she wants to do, the boss has got you doing the wrong thing, the dog's barking at you, you know, the car won't run, and <laughs> you ain't got a dime for the telephone, you just got a quarter, and you're mad, you know, all those sort of things. And pretty soon you say, I need to be a drink, and you probably do. <laughs> <clears throat> so we reach over and take a few drinks. Not to, like the, you know, we don't. Uh, the guys down at the state hospital, uh, down in Benton Unit tonight in the detox ward, they just said, I'm going to have a few drinks. They didn't say, I believe I'll go back to Benton. You know, they just said, I'm going to have a few drinks, and they ended up down to Benton. <laughs> so once we take these few drinks, it sets off the mind, sets off the body. <clears throat> Phenomenon that craving develops when we go through the well-known spree. Doctor, this vicious cycle is repeated over and over again, over and over again. And many of us know about it. And unless we can, and then he leaves the body, unless we can experience an entire psychic change, there is little hope for our recovery. And let's remember that even tonight in the fourth step. This is what we are looking for. Really, that's what the fourth step's all about. It's a process. The whole process of recovery is to experience an entire psychic change. Once we see the problem, then the, the problem reveals the solution. Step two, the solution, quite naturally, because of these two things, we're powerless. So therefore, the solution is power. And our book said this power was 
had to come within the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the support of other people. Uh, you know, we as people, we need somebody to, to, uh, to look at, to focus on. We need an image. If to, uh, I know I did in my life. I needed somebody to look at in the early days or to be a, be a part of my life. I could go to those meetings and I look at those people and they were there sober. And uh, I would leave and I'd have a pretty bad day. I'd, I'd do pretty good for a while, but middle of the day, when things start going wrong, I think about those people still down there sober. And so I, it was a fellowship. It was a support of the other people. It was power in that support, in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is not enough, our book says. <clears throat> but the real thing is in the spiritual experience that comes through This spiritual experience comes about through the working of these steps, 3 through 12. And that's what we're all about tonight. We're all about finding that power. You know, it says if, you are, if your problem is powerless and your solution is power, then the main thing we had to do was to find this power. So our next steps, the 10 steps of recovery, are the steps that bring this about. And step three is a decision based on the first two. So we make a decision to turn our, our will and our lives with care of God as we understand him. And this is just a decision to do that. We talked about this last week. And based on these two things, we're an alcoholic, we got two alternatives. You know, we say the alcohol, for many, many years, you know, if we look at this, I tried many different things, but all along I didn't have but two, we don't have but two alternatives. There's not a lot of things you can do. Um, you know, we say the alcoholic, he's got, he can either sober up over here or he can be locked up or covered up. You know, usually that's what the book says, death or insanity. We don't have too many choices. So we stand at this turning point and we make a decision between which one we want. And surely, you know, with, with honesty, and the book says with honesty you can't fail the program. It talks about that's the only thing we have to have to work these steps. With honesty, we don't have but two choices. Of course, with dishonesty, we can have all kind of roads there. But with honesty, it's, uh, everyone will choose this side. No one will want to go back over to here. And if we decide to go this way there, we'll make a decision to turn over our will and our lives. And we talked about last week uh, what our will is. It's simply... You know, our basic instincts are, are, that are within our lives. And we decide, we know that those are the things that are controlling us. Those are the things that's dominating our lives. And it says, how, there seems no way of getting rid of this. You know, we, we all, we all, we, we've all seen the damage of self-will. You know, many times in our lives we said, I'm going to stop that. I'm gonna, and every time, we, <laughs> most time a person says, I'm going to stop that, well, the horse is already out of the barn, you know. <laughs> Anytime you talk about stopping something, it's already too late, you know. Uh, but once we make this decision, there is work to carry out this decision. And, and I think many times we say step three is the first step in the process of finding this power. And my book says it's just the beginning. So it's just a decision to do this. And there are certain actions that have to be taken in order to carry out this decision. So this brings us to step four tonight. At the end of step three, he says, you know, this was only a beginning. He said, next we have to launch on a vigorous course of action. You know, no dec a decision is no better than the actions that follow it. Now, I'm sure some of y'all might have stayed, or stayed over on the other side too long tonight and drank an extra cup of coffee. And you know, you get a little uncomfortable, but between 9 and 9 o'clock, you're going to have to make a decision. <laughs> and, and that decision will be fine, but if you don't take some action on it, it won't do you a lot of good, you know. <laughs> yeah. So a decision is just that, you know. And I'm sure if we could, if it was possible, I don't know if we could turn, if we could turn our will and our lives to care of God, because God gave it to us. You know, and he has made a covenant with us. It's ours. We can turn the directions over to him, though. But it's ours. You know, we woke up this morning. God, we got what you wanted or not. 
And by the way, don't nobody else want it. It's yours. <laughs> you, you're the one, you're in it. You're going to ask God, you turn in directions and let God direct it. And so now we have to go away. If we want to carry out, there's certain things that block us off from God. Always have. This is a problem with our life. And we're blocked off by self. You know, you show, uh, any, show me, by any alcoholic, you can stand back and watch him. Any alcoholic, predominantly there'll be three things going on with him. He'll always be mad as hell. You know, ain't no, you know what I mean? As somebody or himself. You know, one or the other. You know what I mean? One or the other. You know, he's always mad at them, or they're always picking on him, predominantly. And regardless to another thing that bothers him constantly, he's always full of fear. He don't know what's going to happen, but it's showing the hell ain't going to be no good when it comes. <laughs> and he's always interfering with other people. You know, that's the, that's the, you know, that's the, um, the difficult of an alcoholic, really. My sponsor told me, he said, you know, it's a peculiar thing about, said, an alcoholic is just like a cockroach. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you see a little ant crawling across the floor, and nobody really get excited, you know what I mean? The little ant, getting him a little something. You know, you might, but most time you wouldn't get excited if you see two or three ants. <laughs> Maybe 10. One little cockroach started, everybody said, get him, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> They all want to get that one cockroach. <laughs> he said he don't eat that much. Much more than that. But everything he don't eat, he crawls through and craps in. <laughs> so get him, you know what I mean. <laughs> well, he messes up a lot of stuff. Get that guy. That's where the alcoholic, we mess, he messes into everything. Everybody that comes close to him, he touches, he messes up. So, you know, there's, uh, there's no way that God, God is within. We've said that earlier. Deep down, every person is a fundamental conception of God. God is down deep within us. And to us, our minds are down deep. Our minds so confused with all these things that we really believe that God doesn't exist. You know, because these things have totally blocked us off from this thing that lies within us. And to us, you know, God really doesn't exist. So the real job right now, if we want to make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him from within, then we got to go to work to clear away the things in our mind that block us off from this thing that is within. You know, God ain't lost. <laughs> I mean, he's been there all the time. So the inventory is a process of this. And God, I, I just, I think, uh, you know, I'm so blessed that we have this instrument in our lives. And the big book and the inventory process. You know, our book is very precise here. For many, many years, I, even many of us have had a problem. With, I had problems for years with the, with the inventory. And we did everything else. We were talking, taking the inventory every kind of way, you know. Uh, we said, how you do it? And somebody would say, well, you know, there's a guy in Minnesota. He's got one of them books. Get that. Somebody said, well, there's another book down in Texas. Get that one. You know what I mean? Somebody else said, here's another guy. You, you get all them guys, get the big book. You get so confused, you just don't know what to do with it. You know, uh, the first 100 people laid down their program in our book. And they put the, they said, this is how we did it. But he tells us, therefore, we start upon a personal inventory. And we just look at words. These first 100 people, they sobered up through ideas. Ideas is what change human lives. Ideas is what makes money. Ideas are a powerful thing. And ideas have to be, con in order to get an idea from one person to another, there is about two, few ways we can do it. One way you can put the ideas down in words. And the other person can read the words and interpret them into the idea in his mind. 
Another time, there's no way we can speak the words. This is sound interpreted to get the idea. In this case, they, the first 100 people got the ideas and they put their ideas in words in this book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And they left a, a clear path for us. And I think the only way where we get mixed up is we have to really understand the, the words the same way they understood them. And one of the, he used, he, Bill used the words specifically. He said, therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. Now, we're going to take, he's going to, he's going to make two inventories here. You know, you know uh, this was step four. Step four is a personal inventory. Now, he talks about another inventory. He's, Bill talked with parables. You know, the, many, many years ago, there was a great teacher. And this teacher had a profound way of getting to, to the changing lives of people. And he had the ability to talk with, with use parables and talk with people uh, right into their understanding. And when he talked to a fisherman, he would talk about fish. You know? And when he talked to a, to a shepherd, he would talk to him in, in, like about sheep. And when he talked to a farmer, he would talk to him about grain and cattle and vineyards and things like that. And Bill is doing the same thing with us. He said, you need to take a personal inventory. Then he wants us to compare ourselves to a business. He said, a business that takes no inventory will go broke. So we're going to look at two inventories. We're going to look at our personal inventory, and we're going to look at a business over here. We're going to compare them. You know we're trying to find out about ourselves, but we already understand about a business inventory. But we don't understand about, we've got trying to find out about ourselves. So we're going to look at this business and find out how to inventory ourselves. And the word inventory really means, let's get down to that word. An inventory is a written list of items. That's what the dictionary says it is. Of course, we misuse words a lot. We use them very loosely, and all inventories are written. There's no such thing as a visual inventory. A lot of people times you might go into your kitchen, particularly some of you ladies, and look around and say, and I say, what you been doing? Well, I've been in there taking inventory. Well, if you don't have a written list, you've just been in there looking around. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> because all inventories are a written list of items. And it's very important that we do this because there is no way you could inventory your life in any other way successfully but in a written form. Because a life, the human life is a very complicated thing. There are a lot of things there to inventory. Can you imagine going over to the local grocery store and uh, that businessman says, I'm going to take a visual inventory of my store. He would do fine when he was on the bread. He would have it all in his head. But as soon as he got into the vegetable department, he would forget what he had on bread. See? Because you can't do that. In the same way about this, the only way we can go through our lives and get the real facts is as we get these facts to put them down. You know, and the stock and trade in the grocery store is, is what they got in the vegetable department, the meat department, and the bread. It's, that man can make no more money. His money is going to be exactly based on the quality and the quantity of what's in that store. You know I mean? He can't get no more money that day than what he's got in that store. Uh, in the human life, in a personal inventory, the stock in trade is the thoughts that go through my mind. Every day, my day and my life is equal to my thoughts. That's all I can trade. We are what we think. See, if you're a carpenter, there's no way that you can go out to St. Vincent's Hospital and, let it, and, and, and work as a doctor. Because you ain't, you ain't got that in your stock. <laughs> <laughs> See me? You can only sell 
what you got. You are what we think. Come here. And what? That's, I love that statement. We are, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. So we're going to, you know, and that's a, it's a great shame, not only the alcoholic, but many people. They are never in their lifetime, you know, they're having all kinds of problems. This is going wrong. Everybody's got trouble. You know, every, but how many people stop to look at the stock in trade? Now, my book suggests that, you know, that we're selling some, un, some damaged and unsellable goods. And boy, I had some bad stock. <laughs> I was waiting for big business all the time. One of these days it's going to come in and didn't have nothing on my shelf. So this is a searching and fearless inventory of our thought processes. He so said we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we search in the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways what it defeated us, it was a common, we consider this common manifestations. And you know, we go back to step three, self. And we talked last week about the things that make up self. We said self, every human being has self and it's God given. And, and self is, uh, is made up of basically three things. Um, we have our social instincts and our security instincts and our sex instincts. These are God-given. And these things make up self. You know, these things are there and they serve, we talked about the role that they serve. They serve a vital purpose. But sometimes in every human being, nobody's perfect. When these things come out of control, then they cause problems in our lives. So, yeah, we want to see how self, what is the manifestation of self in my life? These are the things that block us. So in step four, you know, the first thing we're going to do, he's, he's going to tell us that resentment is the number one offender. Uh, it destroys more alcoholics than anything else. And we're going to look at, at resentment. You know, uh, uh, there's another word, uh, resentment. I didn't know what. You know, many times I, don't, I, I didn't know more anything about resentments. Usually I'd say, well, I don't re really resent anybody. Uh, uh, I, I thought that they did this to me, and I just went around mad all the time. I know I didn't have no name for it. I was just mad. You know. uh, well, we look at the word resentments, and it comes from the word, when we see a word re in the front, and it comes from the word centaur, which means to feel. So it means to refill, and it's a, it's a normal process. You know, we human beings have this. Uh, that we have, we've been given this ability, and it's, it really works pretty good. I think we don't have anything bad, by the way. Um, it's just, you know, everything's bad when it's in the wrong place. <laughs> That's the way you use it, right? There's a time for everything. I mean, there's a time for everything in our life. None of us are perfect with all these things. And resentment is the ability to refill. Someone does something to you, and it strikes self. Did it hurt your security, emotion security? Did it hurt your material security? Did it interfere with just threaten your sex life? Did it threaten your self-esteem or your pride? You know I mean? Did it threaten your companionship? When they had to threaten one of these things. Uh, one of these things is threatened, we hurt. So, self is the root of the problem. And when self is hurt, you know, when you, for an, when an alcoholic, when a self is hurt, when you hurt us, they do that one time. They don't do it but once, usually. And then we go home in the quietness of our room or in our car <laughs> or somewhere, and we replay that whole scene over again. I was standing there, she come up, and she said that to me. And we replay the scene over again you know, to hurt ourselves. 
and blame it on her. Now, that's a lie. She did it the first time. You did it that time. <laughs> and the whole thing's a lie. The whole thing's a total lie. Now, every time we play this thing over, it gets worse. Now, on top of that, not only that other person gets meaner and dirtier, you know, and every time you play it over, you get better. You know, I really wasn't doing nothing. And you believe it. That's a sickness that we believe it. And finally, you know, you play it over one time, they are mean, mean, mean. And you, I was standing there and my halo was out, you know, <laughs> when she did it to me. And I did nothing. Okay, let's look at this. We replay that, we replay that over and over and over just to make ourselves sick. You know, and I, I kind of always look at this as a, like the, I like to, I was looking at the football game yesterday. Every time I turn on the football game, I just immediately see that machine. Uh, you know, they got, a, they got a real deal now where they, you know, even argue about it. But they tape all this thing, and when a guy gets hit, didn't hit him but once. You know what I mean? Uh, Sometimes the guy gets up and goes back game. Sometimes I have to carry him off the field. But that ain't good enough for the old noun, so he'll say, let's look at that again. And he'll turn it back <laughs> Now, when you look at it the second time, it's a lot worse. A lot worse. Got a slow motion, living color. You can see the pain in the guy's face. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way the alcoholic does he gets up in the morning turns on his video recorder shines it on the world don't record anything good don't record the good stuff you know what I mean only picks up the negative sick things you know what I mean and he's sharp because he's a good reporter he's they go all day searching for those things. You know I mean? <laughs> Sometimes he can't find them. And then he can create them. You know I mean? He said, I know what she was thinking about me. You know? <laughs> and now that's the height of being, that's as sick as you can get. When you know what somebody else is thinking, you sick as hell. <laughs> <laughs> that's the height of self-will. To know what someone else is thinking. Come in. Okay. And we replay these things over again until that it finally produces resentment is a, a, a number one offender. It's, a, it's like a two-edged sword. It's like a boomerang because it goes out and it comes back. You know, because once you resent what they did to you, then you resent from being, you resent you don't like, be, you resent you. you know, if I hadn't have been here, that wouldn't have happened. You, know I mean? you resent your own self. And that's the worst emotional illness that an individual can have. And that's what we call self-pity, is self-resentments. We resent ourselves. You know I mean? God created us. You know I mean? And loves us, and we resent being us. You know I mean? We will not except us. <clears throat> now, he said this destroys more alcoholics than anything else. It cuts us off from the sunlight of the spirit. I mean, this is what blocks us. How can God direct, how can he end this inner direction that is supposed to be there? It's there. But we don't think it's there. We don't think it's there because it's blocked off constantly by this. How can God di direct a mind full of resentment? So, the first thing we're going to do is uh, inventory our resentments. And, and throughout this process, you know, in our book, we have a, I don't know, he gave us a whole set of instructions and a whole, he gave us an illustration in here how to take a, in our book of how to do an inventory. I don't know how we messed it up, so. He said the first thing we do, he said in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Again, it's got to be written down. You got to have pencil, paper, typewriter, computer, paintbrush, or something to do this with. Okay. 
He said, first, number one instruction, number one, we listed people, institutions, and principles whom we were angry. Now, you don't, you don't have to be sober 10 years to do this either. In fact, you can do it right away. You know, as soon as you get, right after step three is the best time to do it, the book said. <laughs> <laughs> At once, we start on step four. At once. Didn't say 30 days. At once. Okay, now, anybody can do this. List the people, uh, principles, and institutions that they resent. That's very easy to do. Just start up here with one, two, three, right on down. And just keep on going until you get them every one up and down. I know there's no one in here that got any more than three or four. <laughs> but if you do get a little more paper. And just list them. One thing you got to do. You know, don't never try to, uh, to do your inventory this way. Uh, you can't redo this from left to right because if you do, you'd have to put down the person's name, you'd have to put down the cause, and then you'd have to figure out, you, you'd be all mixed up. Well, if you just put down everybody, you resent. We resent people. We resent uh, institutions. Some people resent the army. Some people resent the internal revenue. Some people resent school. You know what I mean? Post office, we all resent them. <laughs> um, just put them down. Principles. Principles are basic. Uh, they're, they're, they're like what's go up, what comes up, going to come down. You know, what you give off, you're going to get back. That's a principle. We we'll put all those principles down, and we totally exhausted. Now, in Bill's case, he gives us this example. He put in Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, my employer, and my wife. I'm sure it's just an example. I'm sure he had more than these. He just didn't want to take any more space in the book. He's got four. Real easy. So now after we get this down, the next instruction it says, we asked ourselves why we were angry. We got their name in there. Now, now we're going to put the cause. You know, why? I mean, from this list, we have to extract this list. This list, the cause is going to come from the name quite naturally. So we have to have the names down. All of them. Once we get all the names down, then we can develop this second column. Now in Bill's case, he said, uh, Mr. Brown, number one, uh, his attention to my wife. Told my wife about my mistress. Brown may get my job at the office. I would have resented him too. <laughs> Mrs. Jones, number two. She's a nut. She snubbed me. She committed her husband for drinking. He's my friend. She's a gossip. Got to put his drinking buddy in the nut house. You know, my employer. Sound like some I used to have. Unreasonable. Unjust. Overbearing. Well, most of them are. They want you to come on Mondays. You know, they're bad about their Mondays. <laughs> Narrow-minded people. Threatened to fire me for padding my expense account. You know, I love this life. My wife misunderstands and nags. Most of them do. Likes Brown and wants the house put in her name. Boy, when you get down there, <laughs> when you get down there to liking Brown and wanting the house put in her name, you know, that's pretty bad. So we got all the causes down. And remember now, we had to get the second column out of each name. This one comes from this one. From the name, we extract the cause. From the name, we extract the cause. So, but we're only thinking about one thing at a time. You know, what is the cause of each resentment? That's easy enough to do. Anybody can do that. Now, in most cases, we found our self-esteem. That's in the social column, self-esteem. Our pocketbook, that's our security. Our personal relations, that's social, that's in the social instinct, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore, we were burned up. Now he gives that sad instruction. Now this goes but he goes back through, he says, on our grudge list, this is a grudge list. Opposite each name, our injury. 
Then he said, was it self-esteem? Was it our security? Our personal relationship, our sex relations was threatened. Now we're going to go over here. Now that we got these two columns, we're going to come back. And we talked about this in step three. Now in step four, we're going to get these two columns. And then we're going to find out which part of self was affected. Let's go back to Bill's list. Let's go back to Mr. Brown, his attention to my wife. Well, what did that infer with? Well, his attention to my wife, it fear with my sex relations. Suppose old Brown gets messing around with my wife. I mean, and my wife's going to kick me out, and I ain't going to have no sex relations. <laughs> and it affected his self-esteem. What are other people going to think if Brown gets fooling around with my wife? told my wife about my mistress. Oh boy, that cut off his sex relation at home. <laughs> then the old mistress went over and told the wife and the, and the mistress cut him off too. Got a little too. <laughs> Ain't got none. <laughs> Brown may get my job at the office. What's threatened? My material security. I mean, some part of self has to be involved in order for you to have a resentment. Self is a relative problem. And for the first time, you know, if we do the inventory like it's laid out in the big book, we don't just list the resentment. Here is, here's a list of resentment. And that, that's not very beneficial. But by using this process, we can list and analyze each resentment. We can analyze it. From the first time in our lives, we can see what's going on with us. So, he says we, uh, we went back through our lives, nothing counting but honesty and thoroughness. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. You know, it, it talks about it on later on. It's just plain that and once we see this, you know, this is the, it's not what people do to us. Now, uh, it's not, it's not them, it's not what they do, it's our reactions to what they do. You know I mean? And when, you, when you're living off of resentment, if we don't control self, then these people dominate and rule your life. It's funny thing about a selfish, self-centered person, he thinks he runs the show and the whole time other people dominate his life, he's like a puppet on the string. What are they going to do? <laughs> you know, he's not free. He explained that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To a precise extent do we squander, to permit these do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. You know, when you've got a resentment, you're not very helpful to your own self. There ain't too much you can do sitting there. Think about the many hours we waste in time playing things over, talking about what we're going to do, what they did to us, over and over and over, reacting to something happened five years ago, five days ago, 20 years ago. I mean, playing it over. And the whole time we turn our lives over to the other person that we don't like, and they done forgot about us. They over having a good time. I mean, they forgot about us. I mean, and we are back there playing this stuff over and over. Blaming it on them. But what do we do? You know, we, we have to, we got to find a different way. So we, we looked at this, and he said, we turn back to the list. Now, I tell you what, now, <laughs> if you hadn't made the list, you couldn't turn back to it. <laughs> but we, we got these three columns down. Now he says we go back to it. It holds the key for the future. It says, how could we escape? We saw that these resentments had to be mastered, but how? Could we wish them away anymore? No, you can't wish them away. This was our course. So we realized that, that people who were on us were perhaps sick, were sick. And we look at these people, and, and they are sick, as if though we didn't like their symptoms. You see sick people every day. And he says, there's a little prayer in step four. There's prayer all through our book. People talk about the prayer in step three and the prayer in step seven. There's a prayer in step four. He said, we ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, patience, pity, and patience we would cheerfully grant as sick friends. When a person's offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. 
how can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. We have a little prayer. You know, and it works. You now there are certain, as we go through these things, we're going to analyze these resentments and, and look at them. And this, you know, once we look at what we're doing, you know, this is a revealing thing. 95% of our resentments, once we analyze them and look at them, we will get rid of them. Step four is a very positive step. You know, while we get rid of most of our resentments, you know, we alcoholics look at ourselves as pretty intelligent people. And once you get your resentments down on paper and analyze them and look of them, most of them look double dumb. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we don't like that. They say, hey man, this is stupid. <laughs> you know? you know? It's really stupid, you know. And most of them will go away. And then it says there are some that won't, that will deep resentment, you know, that we want to cling to. And he tells us the ultimate weapon is to pray for those people you resent. Well, man. And, 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 those, and you will be free of those too. So they're, they're, and this really works. If we work this as it's laid out, we could be totally, our minds could be totally free of resentment. And then we come to the, the last column. There's another column here. We'll get this thing kind of mixed up. Just put these lines out. After we get over here, there's a fourth column. In here. There's a fourth column over here. This is the first column. That's the name. That's the cause. This is self. Now we get down here. We have traced this to this. We trace it across. Now from here, we're going to trace it over here. The final column. Referring to our list again, putting out of the wrongs of our minds, wrongs others have done, we look for our own mistakes. Then he says, where were we selfish, dishonest, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? Though the situation was not entirely our fault, we try to disregard the other person's involvement. Now, you know, each and every case that you have a resentment, it was not just a fault. You had something to do with that. Yeah. It was some way you threatened self and them, and they struck back and retaliated against you. We find out, he says, sometime we find out in each case, sometime in the future, we did something to make these people strike us. And then we, we resented them. We resented them over and over and over in order to put the blame on them and excuse what we have done. And we have never really, we never looked at what, what'd you do? Oh, nothing. <clears throat> nothing. And I use the illustration for many, many of my, in my early days of my sobriety, I came in and, and I had my mother-in-law over here, godly. <laughs> and I always thought it was kind of legal to, to hate your mother-in-law anyway, be your ex-mother-in-law. And uh, I really was steamed up about her. She had interfered with my marriage. I said she had broke up my marriage. That's the way I looked at it. And uh, she struck, what part of self? She struck my self-esteem. She struck, she struck my material security. She struck my personal relationship. She struck my sex life. She struck every part of self. Just bang, 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 bang. And I really hated that woman. <laughs> but finally, you know, four years I had to... Well, to get into this, I had to go look at that thing when I, when I had the ability to really with this inventory. And this is why I was, this is so simple and so fascinating to take our inventory out of the big book. Because, you know, all my life I had resented that woman and I had, I did nothing. And when I really got over here, I said, what did I do? And I, I really looked at it was, at my, at my selfishness and my dishonesty and my self-seeking and my frightening and my inconsideration, you know, for my family, you know, for my wife and my kids. And what this woman had done, she had done what any mother would do to protect her children. And it was me that set the ball to roll. 
And I had hated and resented her all those years to excuse my actions in the situation. So finally, you know, I, I, I'll go through here and I, what was it in this thing? So it was like I said, it was my dishonesty, my self-seeking, my fright, my inconsideration. And so once I started out over here in the inventory process, you know, this is mostly step, this is step four. This is information for step four in here. The whole thing is really step four. But which part of self is involved? And that self is what we talked about in three, the man to give up self. In step five, it talks about what are we going to talk to other people about? And then we're going to be willing to ask God to remove these things because these things are not removed. So we've gotten rid of these resentments, but if these character defects are not removed, we're going to have another batch of them in a few weeks. <laughs> Some little babies. <laughs> so what it does, it analyzes the past and it shows us what within our character do we want to talk about and be willing to let go so in the future we won't get back into this. Now actually, you know, what happened to my mother-in-law, she went on, she went on the top of step eight. See me? She come off the resentment list and she went, I owed her a very big amend. See me? In fact, I owed a lot of people on the resentment list, I owed them to me. On page 67, he says, notice the word fear. And next week, we're going to slip right on into the next phases of the inventory. We're going to look at fear and sex. <laughs>